live or I probably should have done Facebook first. So it looks like we should be live on Facebook and Instagram live. Maybe. There's still a swirling thing on Facebook, so I don't know if it's having trouble. We'll see. Oh, cool. Then I guess we're live on Facebook. Hello. Welcome to D and D. Sorry about the, the Instagram one. We're gonna have to squish a little bit. Um, I do want to start off with yes, we're not wearing masks and we are close to each other, but we do live in the same house. So otherwise, we would not be sitting so close where we'd be wearing masks. But since it's harder to hear people, especially on video stuff with a mask on, um, and since we do live in the same house, we're <laughs> we are social yeah. distancing. We're being safe. It's just that we're it doesn't being good. matter yeah. in this case. <laughs> So, yes, please follow social distancing and such. That's what we're doing. This is a live program, and we're not, you know, having people actually come in because we're still not doing in-person programs in the library yet, but hopefully soon we'll be able to once everything has gotten better as long as people do what they're supposed to, but we'll see. <laughs> so today we're going to be teaching you how to create a character in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. Yep, it's going to be fun. Um... Um, my name is Eli. I work in Teen Services at the Polk County Library. You may have seen me. You may know who I am. You may not. So, hello, it's me. Um, this was my idea, so if it sucks, I'm sorry. <laughs> my name is Billy. I'm a veteran D&D player and a volunteer at the library. That sounds super fancy. Veteran. Veteran. So, Billy is here to help me today, help you guys um, make a character. So it looks like we got a few viewing. Is everything good with our like audio and video? Any issues? Um, if so, let me know. Because sometimes the internet over here gets a little weird. So if we need to adjust anything, I prefer to do it now before we get too into anything. And you guys don't know what's going on. But I am going. Oh, forgot a pencil. That's important. So the things you will need. Uh, you'll need your character sheet. Um, you can get a blank character sheet. You can find one online. Um, we can send you one like if you need one. Yeah, it looks like that. That's the first page. And you will also need at least one D6, which is a six-sided die. Um, off of the die to the side, you find my pencils. There they are. Those are some D6s. And I have some as well. And I have a dice hoarding problem, so you do not have to have this many dice to play D&D. In fact, if you ever play with us at the library, we'll have dice that you can use. Or um, if you're playing online, there are also some like digital dice rollers that you can use as well. Um, I prefer physical dice, but that's just personal preference. Um, I have so many dice, it's ridiculous, you guys. That's not even half of them. But I guess let's go ahead and get started. Um, if you have any specific questions, feel free to ask at any time. Even if they're not super specific questions or something doesn't make sense, whatever, jump in the chat, let us know. We'll try to answer it and make sense of whatever you need made sense of. <laughs> um, so the first thing you want to do when you're making a character, um, at least what I like to do first, is to kind of think about what kind of character you want to make. And I know that sounds kind of nebulous, but just if you have an idea of what you want to do with your character, like do you want to be sneaky or do you want to charge into battle or maybe you want to be like a smooth talker or maybe you want to be a musician, like kind of think about what you want to do or what you want to look like. Or even if you have ideas for a backstory, your inspiration can come from anywhere. Um, but it, it helps to have kind of an idea of your character and that idea can evolve as you go along as well. And also find something that works for you. Somebody else's may not necessarily be your go-to. Uh, for example, that's what Eli does. But what I do is I will look up inspiration on the internet and if I find something that looks cool, um, a character that I like, I will work something around that. Not necessarily rip off the same character, make it your own, but take inspiration from things that you like. Yeah, and that's that's the number one goal with D&D &D, is to have fun. You want to do something you're going to enjoy because if you're trying to you know, just play a cleric because you think the party needs a healer and you don't really want to be a cleric, you're not going to have fun and you're probably not going to be a good cleric because you feel obligated to it. And 
if you're doing something that you have passion for and you're excited about, it's going to be a lot better just for everybody because you'll be able to embrace that character. Not to mention that's also metagaming it's frowned upon. You know, there's that. <laughs> and a number one rule as well is always check with your DM with everything because really it's up to the DM. The player's handbook, all the rule books and stuff, it's guidelines because in the end it's up to your DM and what they decide and what their calls are. Um, so we'll get into that with some things like your ability scores and how you, you know, get those. That's going to be kind of up to the DM because DMs have all kinds of different ways that they'll have you get your ability scores. And they might be over in something too, which is when they take something and make it their own, not necessarily taking it straight out of the player's handbook. So if you ask them, they'll be more than happy to go through that with you. There are a lot of D80s in D&D, but the DM is the only D&D god that matters. <laughs> So I guess to go ahead and get started, um, the first things you'll need to kind of decide for your character are your race, your class, and your background. Um, so we talked just a little bit right before we got started, and I think today I'm going to make a gnome barbarian because it sounds like fun, and I've actually played one before. It is super fun. And what were you going to do? I'm going to do a tiefling bard. Tiefling bard. Bards are fun too. Um, and that'll show you kind of some of the different aspects and things. I keep like my favorite. I feel like a news anchor. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, stuff on Sandy Yeah. <laughs> this just in, in Wildlife. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so on your character sheet, you've got lots of blanks, lots of stuff to fill in. Um, making sure it's an Instagram video, too. Um, and up at the very top, uh, right corner, you've got a box that has your player name. That's probably the first thing you'll fill in. So, you just write your name there. So, Mine says Eli. And then you'll have, um, there's some other things in this box as well. Um, you've got race, class and level, and background. So those are the first things we're going to write now. Just do this as a first level character. Um, so it's going to be that you'll put a one for the level and then whatever class you picked. So for my class, I chose Barbarian. I'll write that in there. And we're creating level one characters. Uh, there is a thing called multi-classing in D&D, and so if you do multi-class uh, with your class and level, you'll do, say, Bard 1 and then Barbarian 2, if whatever, cla whatever class you are, you have individual levels in that class. So Bard will have one level in Bard, and then one level in Barbarian, and you can be a Bardbarian. Oh, Bardbarian. That is a goal for my future, to play a Bardbarian. But also remember that multi-classing is an optional rule, so check with your DM to see if they allow multi-classing. Um, and they'll kind of help you work through that as well. Um, I got distracted because this die is gorgeous and I love it. Um, I it <laughs> Boss Monster, they have so many cool things. So you can get dice at Boss Monster. Not sponsored. Um, <laughs> not sponsored, but they're pretty cool and they've helped us do some programs in the past. Um, all right, so we've got class and level, so I've got Barbarian 1. Um, race, I want to be a gnome, so I'm going to write gnome. And there I'll write tiefling. And if I were writing tiefling, I'd have to look up how to spell it, because the I's and the E's, I always have issues with that. <laughs> and then you also need to pick a background. Did you already know what background you were going to do, Lily? I'm going to do a noble. A noble. And each background gives you kind of uh, extra bonuses, extra modifiers for your character that doesn't have to necessarily do with your class or your race. It always, of course, helps if your class, your race, and your background all complement each other. You can get extra modifiers that way. Um, but if you, they don't have to. So if you want to do a noble tiefling, even though they don't necessarily complement each other, it's up to you. It's just world building. Right. And like, Barbarians and gnomes not necessarily going together. You think of a barbarian as like your tank, your big, like meaty guy that's going to charge into battle, but hey, gnomes, they're small and eh, maybe you don't want to make this one mad. <laughs> um, and for my background, I'm going to be an entertainer, but I'm going to be the gladiator variant, which is a showy fighter, basically. It's, I like to think of it as like WWE. That's, that's what an entertainer is WWE wrestler. It's an entertainment sport. It is. It really is. And it's so much fun because you can have such over-the-top characters. And that's the thing. Like, you may not like that. That may not be something you want to do. Do what you enjoy. Like, I think this is super fun. And that's one of the great things about D&D is you can make it your own and make it what you want. 
And every style of gameplay is valid. So if you would like to do a combat oriented uh, role play, that's up to you. You can totally do that and just min max all of your character, make sure all your stats complement each other, or you can just have fun with it and make a barbarian known. They do not have to complement each other. It is entirely optional. So now we've got our race and our class and our background. And those three things are going to help give us like almost everything we need to build our character, except for one thing. And the next thing we need to do is get our ability scores. Um, this is definitely where you want to check with your DM. Um, and I'm sorry if I make a lot of obnoxious dice noise right now as I move these out so there's room in my dice tray for the deep sixes. Um, there are a few different ways to get your ability scores. You can roll for it, and there are different ways DMs will have you roll. Um, there's also um, the standard array, which is a 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, and 8. And some people will use that. That way, here's your set of numbers. Put them where you want them. Um, and then there's also point buy, which I've, I've never done. I've never done standard array either. Um, but point buy is you have 27 points, and depending on what score, it will cost you a certain amount of those points. Um, anywhere from zero points for an 8 up to uh, 9 points for a 15. For an 8, it's actually negative 1. Really? Okay, then I probably found the wrong information then. Is it in the player's handbook? Yes, because 10 is 0, and then it goes plus 1 for every 2. So 12 is plus 1. Uh, for the modifiers or for point buy? For modifiers. Okay, this isn't modifiers. Oh. This is actually different. Point buy um, is instead of rolling your scores, you oh, have yeah. a bank of like... I know what yeah. point buy is. Uh, okay, I was like, wait, lost. what? <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> but check with your DM. So far, almost everyone I've encountered has you roll. Um, and they have different ways to do it. My phone's being annoying over here. There we go. <laughs> Sorry if you missed anything uh, on the Instagram video there, just talking about different ways to do your scores. Um, but I know the way I do it, um, Typically, if IDM is you roll four D6s and you'll drop the lowest one. Um, and I also let people re-roll ones if they roll a one on one of their dice. But if it rolls a one a second time, the dice lords have spoken and you have a one. <laughs> but you get to drop the lowest one, so it's it kind of helps out with that. So you'll roll four D6 six times. And drop the lowest one and then add them together. So I rolled not too bad. Two fours, a five, and a two. So that's a 13. And this is something you'll want to write it like on the back of one of your sheets or on a scrap piece of paper or something because you're going to play with these numbers a little bit. And you'll just keep doing that until you have six numbers. Oh, roll one, so I'm going to re-roll that one. And see, I rolled one, re-rolled it, and got another one. So wow. the dice gods have spoken. <laughs> Ooh, that's a nine. Ooh, one. Okay, that one was also a one. Okay. <laughs> And this method will give you stronger than average hits. Yeah. Maybe. I currently have 13, 9, 12, and 11, so we'll see. <laughs> Typically, it will give you stronger than average hits. Oh, look, another 12. <laughs> sometimes the dice are nice, sometimes the dice are not. <laughs> oh, look, a 14. That's my highest. Okay. So after you get your stats, you're going to take a look at your class. And you're going to order the the wow well, the skills <laughs> ability scores. You're going to order the abilities by most important to least important. So there are six abilities. There's strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. So strength is how strong your character is, physical strength. Uh, dexterity is how fast they move, how agile they are. Constitution is how hardy they are. Um, if they can take a poison and not get sick. Intelligence is going to be how 
book smart your character is. Wisdom is really typically how emotionally intelligent they are or street smart, uh, common sense. Charisma is going to be how good they are at talking to people or how good they're at how good they are at talking their way out of a situation or charming somebody. Um, I like to use the tomato method to describe the different stats. So strength is how well you can crush a tomato. Dexterity is how well you can dodge a tomato. Um, constitution, um, I'm trying to remember, I think is how well you can handle eating a poison tomato or a rotten tomato. Uh, intelligence is knowing that a tomato is a vegetable or is a fruit. <laughs> <laughs> my you intelligence failed, score is low. You failed your intelligence check. I did. That's probably where my mind's going. I'm a barbarian. Um, <laughs> and wisdom is knowing that a tomato does not go in a fruit salad. But charisma is being able to market a tomato-based fruit salad. It's salsa. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's the way I like to remember them. It helps me make sense of everything a little bit. Um, and depending on what your class is, there will be different um, ability scores that you'll want to have higher than others. Um, so for a barbarian, for inst instance, you want pretty good strength and constitution. Um, but for a bard, you want some charisma and what else? Dexterity, Dexterity. intelligence. Yeah, a little bit of everything. Bards are cool. Uh, bard's usually one of my go-to classes, so. So since I'm a bard, uh, my dump stat, that is the stat that we're not going to be using very often, so if you have a low point, that's where you're going to put it. My dump stat would be strength, uh, and right above that was wisdom. So I have an 8 and a 9. I'm going to put my 8 in strength, and I'm going to put my 9 in wisdom. They're my two least important stats. And for me, my dump stat is going to be intelligence, because I need to hit things. That's what matters. <laughs> now, don't forget your racial modifiers. So yeah. I'm a tiefling, so I have a racial bonus to plus one to intelligence and plus two char to charisma. So since I'm a bard, that plus two char char charisma is really great. And that's something you can, you know, choose a class and a race that will complement each other or something that's just going to be fun. Um, as a gnome, oh, that's a halfling, so that's not going to help me. Turn to the right page. Maybe. Here we go. Um, as a gnome, I get a bonus to intelligence. <laughs> so my intelligence is an 11 instead of a 9. And remember, uh, it, since you have those racial modifiers, if you have an ability score, say you rolled three eights, if you add one of those eights to a skill that you're naturally good at, it could modify. Uh, it could neutralize it so that you're not going to have a negative modifier. Yeah, and that's what 9 was my only would have been a negative modifier. So now that I've got that plus 2, it's an 11. So I'm not quite as dumb. <laughs> and you may see me on my phone. I have my character sheet on my phone. There are a lot of apps that will allow you to do this. And I strongly recommend the one called 5e Character Creator. Um, and I, I like D&D Beyond. Um, they actually just came out with their uh, character building app. For a while, their app didn't let you build characters in it, which was super annoying. Um, but different like websites and services will you know, help you build characters and help kind of walk you through it as well. So if you get stuck on something or if you're not sure you know, that you're getting everything in there right, they can help kind of walk you through and make sure everything goes in the right spot. Also not sponsored. Not yes, sponsored. not sponsored. Not sponsored by anything. Just just us being nerds. <laughs> so after you assign skills, uh, skill points to your skills, you're going to select your proficiencies. And this is going to depend on what class you are and what race you are. So for example, since I'm a bard, I will get three pro skill proficiencies. And there is a list of proficiencies that you can have. And this is where you're going to find the player's handbook. The player's handbook. Yay! <laughs> so for a barbarian, um, it'll say under class features, it'll give you a lot of different things, but it'll tell you skills. 
choose two for from animal handling, handling, athletics, intimidation, nature, perception, and survival. So that's kind of what I have to choose from for my skill proficiencies, and I can pick two. Bards are a little bit cooler. You get three <laughs> from acrobatics, animal handling, arcana, athletics, deception, history, insight, intimidation, investigation, medicine, nature, perception, performance, persuasion, religion, sleight of hand, stealth, or survival. That's so, all of them. Pretty good. Pretty <laughs> Any good. three. Um, and some classes are just a little more specialized, some are a little more versatile, which doesn't mean they're better. Although, it means they're better. Bards, bards are usually my go-to. They're super fun. Um, Oh, one more thing I did want to mention um, with the ability scores. If you do have one that's low, don't get like super upset about it. Um, it's okay. It's actually a really good opportunity for you to role play your character. Um, it can help you build that character because everybody's not great at everything. Like there's something that you're probably not good at. I know there's lots of stuff I'm not good at. So you can't be the best at everything. So embrace your lower scores, work them into your character, and let that help you, you know, flesh out your character and build it into something believable and fun. Yes, perfect. And that, that same train of thought goes with rolling ones, not ones. There is a very common homebrew that a natural one is an automatic failure. And now, please don't get upset if you roll a natural one, because there is a 1 in 20 chance of you doing that. And it's gonna happen. And make it fun. Describe how epically your character failed at something. It's it's a lot fun to not succeed at everything all the time. Yeah, find, find those silver linings. <laughs> it, it, sometimes that can be way more fun to describe how bad you messed up. Or, oh yeah, I couldn't find that thing I was looking for because I got distracted by this bird in the sky. Did you see that bird? It's blue. Wait, what? What are we doing? Yeah. Oh, that was me in real life. Not just me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but once you do have your um, ability scores, you'll put them on your sheet. I like to put them in the small bubble and then put the modifiers above them in the bigger box. But that's uh, preference. That is preference. You can do it either way you want to. Uh, but really, you're going to be accessing your modifiers more often than your full score. But it's up to you. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and fill those in really fast. Oh, and about modifiers. So 10 is a zero. That's, you don't get any bonuses when you make a skill check on that. So Every 11. plus two is plus one. So 11 is plus zero. 12 is plus one. 13 is plus one. 14 is plus two and so on. Um, and I have a mathematical formula if you're a big old nerd like me. Um, it's whatever your ability score is minus 10 divided by two. Rounded down if it's like a half. So if you have an 8 minus 10, it's a negative 2. Divide that by 2, you've got a negative 1 in that skill. Or just every plus 2. <laughs> it's, there's a chart in the handbook as well. I just like knowing the mathematical formula because for me it's easier to remember one formula and then apply it to whatever score. But like I said, big old nerd. Are all so low. <laughs> Mine too. My highest is an 18. It's because I have a plus 2 to charisma. My highest is a 14 because that's what I rolled. <laughs> sometimes DMs will have mercy on you. Sometimes you're just average. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, because sometimes people are average and that is okay. And it's fun to roleplay sometimes. I mean, yes, it can be fun to roleplay somebody who's amazing and everything. But it can be really fun to play somebody who's not also. <laughs> I almost got confused and started writing in the wrong boxes. So after you get those done, you're going to want to write in your saving throws and your ability scores. And when you do your saving throws, you will have a proficiency in two of those saving throws. So you've got the little uh, bubbles next to the box, or in the box next to each of the saving throws. You want to fill in the bubbles for the ones you're proficient in. So for a barbarian, it's strength and constitution. 
And typically those are the ones where you want to put your higher scores as well. Um, having proficiency means you get to add your proficiency bonus, uh, which is the box right above saving throws. Um, starting out at first level, you get a plus two. It's based on your total character level. Um, so even if you multi-class, once you have five total levels, then you'll go up to the next kind of tier, and then you'll have a plus three um, for your proficiency bonus. And there's a chart in the player's handbook for that as well. Um, and a lot of this you can find online in like the standard reference documents also. Um, also, this is one that we do have for checkout in the library. I have it out right now because I need it for the program, but I will be taking out my little tabs and checking it back in. Um, so once it's done being quarantined, it will be available again. All right, so with the saving throws, since I have a plus two to strength, um, it's a 14, and then in proficient in it, add the plus two to my other plus two, I've got a plus four there. My dexterity, I have a plus one, and I'm not proficient, so it's just a plus one. It kind of goes on like that. And then, are you moving on to skills now? Yeah. Okay. I wanted to make sure I wasn't like jumping way ahead or anything. <laughs> uh, so then you've got your skill slots below that. Um, and that's where you mentioned you will have proficiencies in different skills based on your class and your background. And um, on your or, character sheet, yeah, you'll okay. notice that there are circles beside all, beside all of the skills. And this is so you can mark which ones you're proficient in. Uh, yes. So remember earlier we selected skills that we're proficient in? That's where you'll just put a little mark next to those so that you know which ones that you have an extra modifier in. Yeah, some people do trick marks, some people do X's. I like to fill in the bubbles like it's AC because I'm a nerd. <laughs> also, hopefully we'll be getting back to ACT prep soon. So if that's something you're looking forward to or needing anyway. <laughs> nice plug. I know, look at me. That's sponsored by the library. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we probably should also mention with your background and the different skills, if you have two things that give you the same proficiency, it does not double that proficiency, but you can pick a different skill. Um, that's right, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so that you're not going to have, you know, plus four instead of plus two to your, you know, sneak if you have, or stealth sneak is... And again, that's how it is in the player's handbook. Each game master will run their game a little bit differently, so make sure you speak to your game master before building your character. Or during building your character. Or, or even after, like, hey, I did this, is this okay? But a lot of times uh, the DM or dungeon master or game master will want to work with you on your character sheet as well. Um, especially if they have any weird rules or if you're new and they want to help walk you through to make sure you kind of know what's going on. But this is hopefully helpful so you get an idea so it's not overwhelming the first time you try to make a character. No, I'm distracted. Ah, oh, right, my background. And make sure when you're picking your background that you're picking one that suits your style of gameplay. Like for example, I chose the noble background, so that also adds different role play elements. So as a noble, I can use my my name and my family history to maybe get something that I want that I wouldn't otherwise get. Or as a sailor, if you choose the sailor background, you can procure a passage on a ship for your entire party for free. A um, an urchin note back an ur urchin background. Sorry, I cannot speak today. An <laughs> urchin background good. can navigate a city in half the time that it would normally take. Uh, they're all pretty great. You just have to choose one that you're that you're interested in playing. In fact, the first few words of urchin are "You grew up on the street, alone, orphaned, and poor." <laughs> but look for a background that speaks to you that you think is going to be fun to play. 
All right, so for entertainer, I get acrobatic and performance. And I'm going to take intimidation. Now I'm stuck between whether I want to do athletics or perception. I know perception can be useful, and for an entertainer, it's useful to be able to kind of see your audience, see if they're having a good time, and kind of know how to fix your performance for them. Um, but athletics, you know, you need to do feats of strength, that comes in there too. While Eli is getting started with their skills, let's talk about personality traits, ideals, bonds, and flaws. Um, these are something that you can create yourself if you already have an idea of how you want to build your character, or it's something that you can roll for. Um, different classes, different races, or different backgrounds uh, come with different presets, you could call them. Um, you do not have to use them. You can use one or all of them. It, Again, entirely up to you, you build your character, but you can find online uh, rolling sheets where it'll give you a list of preset traits and you can just roll a D8 or a D6 and whatever that number lands on, that's the one you can use. Uh, again, you don't have to do it if you already know how you want to build your character, uh, then of course build a, the character the way you would like to, but if you have no idea, um, it's a great jumping off point. And also in your background, it'll have um, some small charts that you can use as well. Um, did you mention that? Because I know you talked about using that online. Yep. Um, okay, and you can find other ones online as well if you don't like the ones that are in here. And find different ones. Oh, low battery again. So we'll I'll call it like Instagram. <laughs> Apologies to Instagram. My phone is trying to die, so if it dies. We'll have the full video on Facebook and hopefully be able to get it off of there and put it in other places. Um, our goal today was actually to do this with YouTube Live and I went to do that and YouTube's like, oh cool, you can do this after 24 hours. Thanks YouTube. <laughs> but we learned something today. So for back on that topic, uh, in the player's handbook under Noble, for ideal I could have respect, uh, responsibility, power, family, or noble obligation. So I'm going to roll a d6 and get that information. Let's see, I rolled a 1. So I'm going to go for respect. Respect is due to me because of my position, but all people, regardless of trait station, need to be treated with dignity. So I'm going to have that as my ideal. Respect. And you can also... <coughs> I'm so sorry. Excuse me. <laughs> um, <whoa>. Not COVID. <laughs> These things not a symptom, it's allergies. Um, you can also, if you roll something and don't like it, you can re-roll it. Like, this is just to help you decide if you're not sure. Sometimes I look through the list and go, mm, I like that one. Sometimes I roll for it and go, I don't like that, I'm going to roll again. <laughs> and again, have fun with your character. If you don't like something about your character, change it. It's all about having fun. Do you get your skills? Yeah, I've got my skills. I'm looking at my personality traits and stuff now. I think I'm gonna have to go with I get bitter if I'm not the center of attention. My little attention hog barbarian. Maybe that's what sends me into a rage. Why aren't you paying attention to me? <laughs> <laughs> and for, it's fun. <laughs> for bonds, I rolled that I will face any challenges to win the approval of my family. It's a noble uh, bond, and that's what I rolled, so that's what I'm gonna go with. And again, you don't have to go with what you rolled. Also, I believe when I've built characters in D&D Beyond before, when you're doing personality traits, it actually has you select two. So you can have more than one. Um, characters are multidimensional. Like, there are different things about you that could be described. You're not just a person who likes chocolate ice cream. Like, there's more to you than one trait, so. Build three-dimensional three characters. On a two-dimensional piece of paper. <laughs> but it's extra dimension in your mind. Probably the most important personality trait that you can build is gonna be your flaws. 
And again, you can create this on your own if you already have an idea of what you want to do, or you can roll for it. So I'm going to roll for me. I rolled a one. I've rolled a one each time. Uh, this hey, time, you're not rolling your stats, so <laughs> this one is going to go in dice field. But uh, so my for my flaw, I secretly believe, believe that everybody is beneath me, and that actually goes really well with my ideal, the respect that respect is due to me because of my station. But everybody else should be treated respect regardless. Um, so my flaw is that I actually believe that they're beneath me. Everybody should be treated treated with this respect, but I should get more of it. Exactly. <laughs> Tweeted with respect. I cannot. <laughs> okay, Tweety Bird. Tweety Bird is my favorite Looney Tunes character. One hundred percent. Oh nice. I think I'm also gonna pick a separate um, personality trait as well. That I love a good insult, even one directed at me. <laughs> And I think with that, my flaw um, will be I once satirized a noble who still wants my head. It was a mistake that I will likely repeat. <laughs> and if you have an idea for, you know, a flaw, bond, ideal, or personality trait that's not on here, go for it. I mean, even maybe poke around in some of the other backgrounds. Maybe they have something that you can apply to your character. Remember, guidelines, not rules. Guidelines. And these aren't even really guidelines. They're a basic structure that you can choose to use. <laughs> Here's a bucket like. of ideas you can drink from. Exactly. <laughs> My ideal at this time will be people. I like seeing the smiles on people's faces when I perform. That's all that matters. Got any money? That's not the entire well, altruistic here. You know, that's all that matters that I will tell you about. <laughs> <laughs> Is your ideal greed? I'm only in it for the money and fame. <laughs> While Eli is filling that out, I'll talk very, very briefly about alignment. Um, it's something we did not go over when we yes. were covering yet. We are going yes. over alignment. I mean, it's on the it's on the sheet. On the Never album. mind. I will not talk I mean, about alignment. We can talk about alignment. Yeah. We're kind of going in in our own little order here, anyway. <laughs> So alignment is really going to be something you're going to have to talk to your your dungeon master or your game master about. A lot of people do not use alignment in their games for good reason. Um, and a lot of people do. So if you choose to use alignment, if your DM is using alignment, make sure that you talk to them about what each alignment means to them. Uh, because each, each alignment has different roles that they play in the party, different ways that they role play. Uh, for example, a chaotic evil character is not necessarily going to steal from their party and murder hobo people just because it's what your character would do. That is an excuse. And it's or a chaotic fun. neutral. <laughs> Some of us have had experiences. <laughs> so just because you're playing, the way I like to explain to people is that a good aligned character will do things for other people just because uh, they will look after other people before themselves. An evil aligned character will look after themselves before other people. A neutral character could swing either way, depending on the situation. On the situation. Yeah, exactly. So you have good, neutral, evil for the alignments. And again, that doesn't mean you're just going to steal from people or kill people just because you can. That just means if you're in a situation, you're going to look after yourself first. 
Because and just some like people say, oh, sorry, <laughs> just like in real life, your actions have consequences. So if you turn on your party, they outnumber you, <laughs> and they can turn right back on you and make you not a problem anymore. Exactly. And again, just like in real life, even if you are an evil person, you don't necessarily believe that you are evil. Yeah, food for thought. That's some of the best villains, like, like, oh, I'm an evil scheming villain. It's like, I am doing what needs to be done because no one else will do it. I'm right. Thanos. Yeah. While we all know Thanos that... Thanos did nothing wrong. Well, we all know that he is an evil aligned character. He doesn't believe that he is evil. He believes that he's doing the right. And you can make your character the same way. That In fact, it is really encouraged. character. That's how to build dynamic characters that people can empathize with, even if they're not necessarily in the right. Um, oh, it's Leah Bond. I'm gonna roll a d6 for this one and see what happens. I might roll a d6 again if I get the first two because I don't want them. It was a one, so I'm gonna roll it again. It's a six. Okay. I would do anything for the other members of my old troop. So it looks like Eli is finishing up filling out her personal their personality traits. So let's move on to the center column of your character sheet. If you have a character sheet in front of you, you can see what I mean by center column. There you go. Oh yeah, look at that. Look at that. We're talking about this right here. Go to Instagram too. <laughs> They're over this that. One. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think initiative is probably the easiest one to fill in next. Your initiative is just your dexterity modifier. So I've got a plus one, so my initiative is plus one. Um, if you have a negative to dex, you have negative to initiative. So um, Initiative is actually the second easiest to fill out because the easiest one is your speed modifier. That I don't know. I think your easiest is player name. <laughs> <laughs> your speed modifier is going to be how fast you can move in six seconds. Round is six seconds, and your speed is how quickly you can move in that time frame. So this is determined by how large or small your character is. Most character, most races in the player's handbook are medium, which gives you a base speed of 30. So for me, I'm going to write 30 there. Eli has a known character, so theirs may be a little bit different. Trying to remember. I've also... I've done gnomes in Pathfinder as well, so sometimes I get a little confused on what everybody's stuff is. Um, Pathfinder is great too. It's a lot more complicated than 5th edition, yeah. so we're going to go with 5th edition for now. I if you also... want us to walk through Pathfinder with you, please drop a comment, drop a like, and let us know, because we will do that if you would like us to. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I just realized I forgot something. I thought it was weird that I only got a bonus to intelligence. I forgot to choose my subrace. <laughs> so with gnomes, you can be um, a rock gnome, a forest gnome. There's also a variant that's a deep gnome, but that's not in player's handbook, so we're not going to bother with that right now. Um, so, oh, oh, it is there. Look at that. The deep gnome is in the player's it's handbook. It's mentioned. It doesn't give like their um, ability to score increases and stuff. So, and when we say it is in the player's handbook. Um, there are a whole bunch of races for D&D, &D, um, canon races too, specifically by Wizards of the Coast. So you can be, for example, Changeling, that is a playable race. It's not in the player's handbook. It is in a different book that was released later. Make sure you're talking to your game master or your dungeon master before you choose any of the races that are not in the player's handbook, just to make sure that they're okay with playing them. Like a centaur or a tabaxi, which is like a cat person. They're super cool. There are tons of races and they're not all in the player's handbook. 
Uh, but we're just going with Player's Handbook today because we know it's something that will be available in the library for you guys to look at later. Um, and it's what you're going to be able to find easily available, you know, online. Anywhere. Legally. 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 Yes. <laughs> Don't do bad things. And these are going to be, typically, the ones in the Player Handbook are free on D&D Beyond if you would like to use their character creator. Yes, there are a few things. I think the Gladiator variant of Entertainer I had to buy on there, but you can you can do a lot without having to purchase anything. Um, for the most part, if it's in the for the most part, the if most it's part. in the player's <laughs> handbook, it is on free on DD Beyond. Hi, Melanie. <gasps> hi, Mel. I know you're gonna say hi to me, but I'll say hi anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, my speed is 25 feet because I am small. Um, gnomes typically are between three and four feet tall and weigh about 40 pounds, so small things, uh, but that's okay. It just more roleplay opportunities. I can't get quite as far, but because I got little legs. So we've got our initiative and our speed. The next thing we're going to fill out is going to be... we talk about initiative and like what it is. I think we're just like, no, initiative, <laughs> and then we explain speed, but not <laughs> initiative. I'm going to try to fix where I forgot to pick a thing. So, my mistake, going back to initiative, we fill out our initiative modifier there. This is how quickly you're going to move in combat. So something has jumped out at you and started attacking you. Does it move first or do you move first? Or does your other party member move first to attack it? It's going to be your reflexes, how fast you can get to the monster and, and your turn in the initiative order. Which so, is why it's based on dexterity. Which is why it's based on dex, exactly. So you're going to roll a d20, and you're going to take that number on the d20, I got a 12, and you're going to add your initiative modifier, so I'll have 13 total. If you would, please roll for initiative. Oh, I want to use my own. I've got this full pink one. So 16. Eli rolled a 16, and they're, one. they're going to add their initiative modifier, so they have a 17. They would move before me in the initiative order. Small like that. I'm trying to decide which gnome sub race. While well, Eli is deciding their sub race, you're fine. I didn't realize I hadn't picked it. I was like, this is weird. Let's move on to AC. This is your armor class. Uh, this is going to be how hard you are to hit, whether it's because you're fast and nimble and you can move out of the way, or because you have a lot of armor on your, on, you're wearing a lot of armor, so it hits your armor and it doesn't hurt you. Um, or it could be that they've just swung wide and they missed you entirely. Um, so your AC is going to be your dex modifier plus the armor that you're wearing. So for example, I'm a bard, I have light armor, so I can choose to start off with leather armor. That gives you plus 11 to your armor class. So 11 plus my dex modifier, I have an armor class of 12. So something would have to roll above a 12 on the d20 in order to hit. So I just rolled an 11, that would not hit me. I could say I dodged out of the way before it got to me. Um, and the class that you start out with is going to determine what armor you start out with. And you will check the player's handbook to determine what, what items and what gear you can start the game. Okay, I'm going to be a rock gnome, which is the most common sub-race of gnomes. Uh, so if you do have a sub-race, pay attention to that. <laughs> um, and so with my forest gnome, I also get a plus one to my dexterity ability score. Um, no, that's forest gnome. With a rock gnome, I get a plus one to constitution. Um, so that actually put it up to 14, so now my constitution modifier is plus two. So now I get to redo all my stats that involve dexterity, or that involve constitution. We cannot keep these untangled today. Okay. So the next thing you're going to do after you determine your AC, you're going to find a, for me, because I'm a bard, I'll have a D8. Uh, so this is going to be different depending on 
what class you do. For example, a wizard would be a d6. Most classes are going to be a d8. Belize, being a barbarian, the tank. D12. They get a d12. So I'm going to take my d8. They're going to take their d12. I rolled a 6 on my d8. So I would add my constitution modifier to that, which is plus 1. Um, and you may want to talk to your DM because typically the way I do it is first level, you get max. Um, because you're going to be pretty squishy at first level anyway. Squishy means easy to hit, easy to kill. <laughs> um, so that would give me, doing it that way, I would get a 12 plus 2, I'd have 14 hit points to start out. Remember to talk to your game master with any rules that they follow. I think, I think that's in the playbook. book. I think it is. So you'll take your D8 and, that's why we and then add know. your... <laughs> make stuff up. <laughs> exactly. And then take your your hit die and add your constitution modifier to it. So I went through and I was trying to fix them. I started changing decks instead of constitution. Oh, constitution doesn't change anything in the skills. The more you know. <laughs> I so, apologize for the mess I am. <laughs> <laughs> Beneath that, you're going to see something called temporary hit points. And these are hit points that you can get from having different spells. For example, a spell can give you temporary hit points. Or anything that happens in-game. If, if your DM says this gives you temporary hit points, then it does. Um, these are hit points that will be used first. And they will disappear after a long rest. So, for example, my max hit point is going to be 9, because it's the d8 plus your con modifier. Temporary hit points are going to be, for example, this gives you 5 extra temporary hit points. So I will have... 14. 14. <laughs> I was like, are you trying to do math, or did you forget the number 5? <laughs> no. <laughs> 14. Did you hear the, the smoke coming out of my ears there? Um, That's what that was like. Did you hear the smoke? Um, Small bit too. I apologize. I just lost my train of thought. Um, so I would use that five first. If something hit me, it would take away from the temporary hit points first. Um, if I do not use those temporary hit points and we take the party takes a long rest, the temporary hit points will disappear unused. But just a long rest, not a short rest. Just a long rest. Um, also, one thing we kind of didn't do in the previous column, I think we can jump back to really quickly, is just passive perception or passive wisdom. Um, to get that, it's going to be 10 plus whatever your, your wisdom modifier is. So if that's a negative modifier, it's 10 minus that number. Um, so since mine is a zero, my passive wisdom perception is 10. Mine and is 10 minus one, so I have nine for passive perception. And that's just, if we're not really looking for something, if something happens, how likely, how likely we are to notice it. This is mostly going to be up to your game master's discretion, um, whether they choose to tell you, hey, my, my passive perception is nine, so how likely am I to notice this without actively looking for it? And I, I do want to throw in as well, perception is not just what you can see. Um, I feel like a lot of times we think, perception, that's the stuff I see. But it could also be things that you hear or things that you like sense or smell or, you know, any of your senses, any way you can perceive something. Um, Following the same train of thought there, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> if you have a character that is blind or deaf, that is a fun role-playing opportunity. You'll just take off, you'll automatically fail checks for hearing or seeing perception checks. Hey, did you see that? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> However, <laughs> do we want to get into Shikasta and how you can have... Don't spoil Critical Role. Okay. Critical Role is fun. <laughs> you should watch Critical Role. I didn't, I didn't feel like that was a spoiler. He's a deaf NPC. Well, yeah. Well, he's a NPC or PC, kind of. NPC, PC? He's a guest PC. <laughs> okay, so... What, what they were talking about is, in Critical Role, there is a guest player who is called Shikasta, that's his character name, and he is completely blind. He uses his familiar to see for him. 
But that's a real specific thing. Once again, talk to your DM. <laughs> but he's super cool. And so if you're a big old nerd, Critical Role is a fun time. Critical Role is a great way to learn how to play D&D. Or if you're wanting to learn to DM, it's a great way to learn to be a better DM. <laughs> Matthew DM Mercer. It. Yeah. Now, again, if you've already watched Critical Role or you're going to watch Critical Role before actively playing, there is a thing called the Mercer Effect. Uh, because he is so amazingly fantastic, do not compare yourself to Matthew Mercer or to any of the cast members on Critical Role. They are professional D&D players. Your first time playing will not be like that. Or if it is, that's fantastic. Uh, if it's not, that's okay. That's normal. Have fun with if it. If it is, you're yourself. probably a warlock who is a person. Exactly. <laughs> not your character, you person. <laughs> So do not compare yourself to Matthew Mercer or to anybody on the cast of Critical Role. They are fantastic, but so are you. Or so anybody play. else online, like Matthew Colville, who is exactly. another relatively famous DM, super talented, um, and has great videos about learning to be a DM, but also helps you understand that, hey, you're not going to be great the first time. That's okay. You're learning. It's a skill that you build. Uh, whether you're DMing or you're playing, it is a skill that you can build over time. You will not be perfect your first time playing. And if you are, teach me. <laughs> <laughs> For real. Okay, let's see. We've done the size and the speed. Um, what are we going to do next? Um, good hit points. Do we want to do look at features next? Let's look at features. Features and traits. You get features and traits from many different things. <laughs> your race, your class, and your background typically all have features and traits um, that you will get. Um, so one thing I get um, as a gnome, I have dark vision, which means that I have superior vision in dark and dim conditions and can see um, in dim light within 60 feet as if it were bright and darkness as if it were dim. Um, and in darkness, can't tell colors, only shades of gray. There's a popular trope that if your DM describes a dark cave, all of the players in the party say, I dark have vision. dark vision! Because <laughs> almost all races have dark vision except for humans. Um, portals don't have. That's not a poor no, race. And yeah, I'm into poor races. Yeah. Once you start getting into other races that are not in the player's handbook, a few of those do not have dark vision, like turtles, changelings. Uh, there are a few others, but they don't centaurs. have centaurs. Do not have dark vision. Uh, so once you start getting in the, into the core races, they mostly have dark vision. The ones that are not in the core races, sometimes they don't have dark vision. So you have to be extra careful on that. Yeah, just know that if you don't have dark vision, if it's dark, you can't see. Yeah, it happens sometimes. So as a tiefling, I have dark vision and fire resistance, and I can cast the thaumaturgy cantrip at will. Dragonborn don't have dark vision either. That's actually surprising to me. Yeah. Oh, not in there. So let's see. Um, I also, as a gnome, I get something called gnome cunning, which means I get advantage on intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saving throws against magic. So if I'm trying to save against some magical effect, I have a better chance of doing so. And don't forget to check your background and your class for additional features. For example, as a noble, I can secure an audience with a local noble, um, and I will always succeed if on that because it is a background feature. Uh, and as a bard, I have bardic inspiration, which I can inspire an ally within 60 feet and give them a bonus roll on one ability check, attack roll, or save, plus my charisma mod per day. So starting at level one, that's a d6 for a bard. Um, but as you gain levels, that die is going to increase. So I believe at level 5 or 6, it's going to increase to a d8. And that can be very useful. Yes. Big time. Um, 
it is fifth level, it goes up to a D8 uh, for Bardic Inspiration. And then at 15th level, it's a D12. Can you imagine how incredibly powerful that is? Because uh, 12 on its own is usually past. Yeah, it'll pass any easy DC. Oh, Instagram has paused due to poor connection. That's unfortunate. Okay, so quick Facebook. Kind of... While we've lost our Instagram, let's talk about. No, I'm just <laughs> All right, and so with my sub race, I also get some extra things like um, artificer's lore. Um, so when I make an intelligence uh, history check related to magic items, alchemical objects, or technological devices, I can add twice my proficiency bonus instead of any proficiency bonus that normally applies. Now on that, I haven't done this before. Does that mean only if I already have proficiency or if I don't have proficiency, I still add double proficiency bonus? Because I've not encountered this one before. That's even if you do not already have proficiency. Cool. For example, at level or two. Or double check with your DM. <laughs> or double check with your DM. Uh, at level two, bards get what's called jack of all trades, and you will add one half of the proficiency bonus to every skill that you do not already have proficiency in, which is it's amazing. Fantastic. That's one of the reasons I love bards. <laughs> it includes your initiative. So that, that's pretty cool. If you want to play a bard, I highly recommend. I would also recommend bard. And again, that's going to get even more powerful the more you level up. So at level one, you have a plus two proficiency bonus. So that at level two, you'll still have a plus two proficiency bonus. So you'll add plus one to every skill that you don't already have proficiency in. Um, also, another um, feature that I have, because I am a gladiator, which is part of the entertainer background, is a feature called By Popular Demand, which means wherever I go, I can find a place to set up and perform and you know, get an audience, earn some gold, such. Um, there's some more, some more things to that as well, but I'm not actually looking at that one yet. I just remember it's super cool. Also, rock gnomes have a neat thing called Tinker, which gives you proficiency with artisan's tools and allows you to spend an hour and 10 gold worth of materials to construct a tiny clockwork device, um, which is pretty neat. And there's a lot of other stuff about that. So you can have up to three such devices active at a time. And then what else? Yeah, by popular demand. You, oh, you're not writing out the whole thing. <laughs> that's why it's taking me so long. I'm like writing out the full. And I usually do be, this online. <laughs> and that is going to be at your discretion. If you kind of already know um, what they are, then you don't have to write it out the full thing. If you're not sure what they are, then by all means, go ahead and write it all out. Uh, for on mine, I just wrote Division 60, Fire Resistance, Thaumaturgy, Secure Audience with Local Noble, and Bardic Inspiration, because I know what those are, so I don't need to write those out. If you do need to write them out, by all means, please do it. Yeah, so sometimes I need to write them out. Uh, like another thing with By Popular Demand, um, at the place that you can find to perform, usually it's like an inn or a tavern, sometimes with a circus or a theater or even a noble's court, um, you receive free lodging and food of a modest or comfortable standard, depending on the quality of the establishment, and as long as you perform each night. So basically, they will like pay your tab as long as you perform there, which is pretty neat. 
Also, when strangers recognize you in a town where you've performed, they typically take a liking to you. It's like, hey, I know you. You're that crazy wrestler thing. <laughs> Basically. Let's see. Oh, I didn't look at my class yet. There are teachers in class, yes? Yes. Sometimes. Oh, yeah. They're rage. <laughs> I'm a barbarian. <laughs> so, yeah, I get rage. I think you get twice the long rest at first level. It might be in the. Here it is. Yeah, I get two rages for long rest. And my rage does a plus two damage. You also get advantage on strength checks and saving throws. Um, you get a bonus to your damage with melee weapon attacks um, and resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. So, be nice. Um, there's also unarmored defense, which is handy. That you have some kind of increased AP um, or armor class, even when you're not wearing armor. Ten plus Dex plus Con would be my AC. Yeah, we haven't. Did we do AC yet? No, I don't think we did. Yes, we have. How did you know your AC? Did you already? Yes. We didn't talk about equipment yet. It was based on your armor. I did say so. Did you? Mm -hmm. Was that when I was yes. writing out things too long? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Well, with unarmored defense, my AC is ten plus Dex mod plus Con mod. So, um, oh, and I can still use a shield with that, by the way. Um, so that's 10 plus 1 plus 2, so it's 13 AC with no armor on, which is nice. And do barbarians get proficiency in heavy armor? I don't think so. I think it's light and medium armor. So we can do proficiency next. Um, uh, languages are kind of in there, too. Usually it's in your class and maybe your background will give you some proficiency. Um, in or some languages, um, proficiency that have light, medium armor, and shields. So, as a bard, I would have proficiency in light armor and simple weapons. Um, and I also have simple and martial weapon proficiency because I hit things. <laughs> And if it says just simple and martial weapons, uh, that includes melee and range. Because, yeah, that's what it does. Because sometimes when you look at the chart, it's like, but these are split into these things. So. Your proficiencies are going to be based on your class. Eli is playing a melee class, so they're going to have more armor and weapon proficiency. A bard is a dexterous caster class, so I'm going to have light armor and simple weapons because my, my main attack is going to be magic. Bards are really good just kind of all around. They're very flexible They're characters. They're very great characters. Bards and clerics are among the most customizable builds. Yeah, cleric you can totally tank out if you want to. I've never played a cleric, but They're great. they look cool. <laughs> clerics can be a caster class or a melee class, depending on how you want to play them. Or a little bit of both, you know. Or both. Okay, so I have those proficiencies from my class and then your background also gives you some proficiencies did you already get your background proficiencies as well yes moving so fast um your languages so your languages are going to be based on what race you are plus uh your intelligence so as a tiefling i will have infernal and common just off the bat. Um, almost all of, all races will come with common, just as a standard. It's um, the common language, you can speak it. <laughs> if you play a monstrous race, you may not have common. So if you're playing a goblin or a bugbear or an orc, uh, check with your DM to determine whether or not your character will know common. Well, typically goblins, at least in the monster stat block, do know common. So. Again, check with your DM. <laughs> just wants to make absolutely sure. Yeah. And once again, those are extra out there kind of 
uh, races that aren't in the player's name book. Totally lost track of what I'm doing. Cool, proficiency. All right. So as an entertainer, I get proficiency with a disguise kit and one type of musical instrument. And as a noble, I would get skill proficiencies in history and persuasion, and also tool proficiencies, one type of gaming set, an extra language of my choice, and I get some additional equipment uh, as well. But we'll get into that now. Yes, I think equipment is coming up next. And as a gladiator, um, I can actually replace the musical instrument um, for my equipment package with an unusual weapon, uh, but that's equipment focused there. Um, it does not, I think I still have the proficiency. Um, and with musical instruments, you get to choose what instrument. Um, and this is another check with your DM kind of thing, because um, there is a list on the equipment page that you can look through. Um, and some DMs will allow you to do something a little more out there. Um, I had a character once that the instrument was like little ankle bells that she would wear, um, which is not like listed in the regular equipment, but... The bard but. that I'm currently pay playing is a bard of swords, uh, so my rapier is actually my magical focus, um, but I also play the pen. So what is next? Is that next? Equipment. That also helps uh, that my player's handbook is on my phone, so I can just search for something with the nifty search tool while yeah. Eli has to flip through pages. I like to flip through pages. I work in a library. <laughs> so with equipment, um, this is largely going to depend on your class. So as a bard, I can start off with a rapier, a long sword or a simple weapon. And a simple weapon, that is just a standard melee weapon, um, a dagger or a rapier or a short sword, something along those lines. Uh, so I'm going to choose a rapier. I can choose a musical instrument. Let's go ahead and say I want to use the lute. And I can select between either a diplomat's pack or an entertainer's pack. 5e makes these things really easy for you because they have these packs. Now, I do not have these memorized, uh, and nobody expects you to have them memorized either. That's why they make books. That's why they make books. <laughs> and websites. That's why they you have know, the internet. For, for your class, uh, choose between which pack you want to role play with. Um, so I am going to choose the entertainer's pack because it has stuff in it that I would want to use as a bard. It has a backpack, a bedroll, two costumes, five candles, uh, rations, a water skin, and a disguise kit. Those are all very useful for how I want to play my character, so I am going to choose an entertainer's pack. I will also have leather armor and a dagger because of my class, they're just going to give me that. Alternatively, if you want to, you can start off with a certain amount of gold and that's going to be different depending on what class you have. Uh, typically, it's going to be a die times two. So what that die is is going to be different depending on what your class is. Once again, just talk to your DM kind of thing. Um, but I really like having the, the packs where it's just like, hey, here's your stuff. Cool, thanks. <laughs> Especially if you're getting started. Um, also, something we didn't really mention previously if this is all pretty new to you and you're not totally sure what to do, like you kind of know what class you want to be and what race, but you don't know quite what to do after that, there is a quick build in the player's handbook um, after each one. So like for Barbarian, um, it says you can make a Barbarian quickly by following these suggestions. Put your highest ability score and strength, followed by Constitution, choose the Outlander background. So that kind of gets you started on a pretty classic Barbarian, you know, here you go. Um, in case this is 
overwhelming and new and you just want a little bit of direction but preset can, characters yeah which is sometimes better for you know getting in and figuring things out and from there you can go oh i didn't like that and i think i want to do this thing and, you know it gives you a good starting point so we've talked about how your class will determine some of the things that you start off the game with but your background will as well so as a noble, I'm going to start off with an extra set of fine clothes, a signet ring, a scroll of pedigree, and 25 extra gold pieces. Uh, and each background is going to determine what you start off with. So for example, I know an urchin starts off with a pet mouse, which is pretty cool. Nice. Um, I am starting out with um, a musical instrument or a special weapon. Um, a a unique uh, but inexpensive, like a trident or a net or some sort of weird weapon like that. Um, and I also get um, a favor from an, an, an admirer, and that could be a love letter, a lock of hair, a trinket, um, an entertainer I did previously had like a little doll of herself <laughs> that like a kid had made and like given to her. Um, she's like, hey, you're so cool, I made this. And she was like, I'm the best. Um, it was adorable. <laughs> and uh, I also get costume, and it tells you how much gold you have as well. So I get 15 gold. And the gold goes um, in the little boxes. You want to explain the little money boxes there? So it looks like we've completely lost Instagram. Yeah, I think my phone is dead. Sorry, Instagram. But here we have where your equipment um, and on this little side here, there are going to be like little things. I cannot get close enough to show you, but in this separate little circle here on the side of those, yeah, they're it, real light. it has uh, copper pieces, silver pieces, gold pieces, and platinum pieces. Um, it also has EP there. Talk to your DM about that one. Most game masters do not use that. Um, and I have used it before, and it's sort of a thing that if you use the EP, the Electrum pieces, it's kind of like a why do you have that? Like, it's not super common. Like, they know it's money, but like, it's like having $2 bills or half dollars or things like that kind of would be in our society. Just a, who spends that? Why do you, what? <laughs> so for every game master, it's going to be a little bit different. I know Matthew Mercer uses it a little bit differently, but for most people, it's going to be 10 copper pieces per silver piece and 10 silver pieces per gold piece, and 10 gold pieces per platinum piece, and so on. I know- Except Electrum is five silver. Or something weird. Yeah. Um, I know my current uh, game master in the game that I'm playing, uh, He, I think he does 100 gold pieces per platinum piece. So again, talk to your game master because everybody's gonna run their game just a little bit different. And also platinum is a thing that of course, depending on the game master, is not a lot of people will have platinum. Like, or be able to break a platinum. If you want to use a platinum piece at a tavern, you may not be able to to do that. Yeah, it's like going into Sonic with a hundred dollar bill, and you're like, "Hey, I want to pay for my milkshake with this." And they're like, "No, sorry, you really can't break that." <laughs> Which, having worked in retail, totally understandable. <laughs> Hmm. You can get a great axe or any martial melee weapon. Barbarians do have a little bit of flexibility in their starting equipment. Barbarians are pretty cool because you can play however you want to. I mean, they're always going to be a martial class. Yeah, but you will hit things. But if you want to use a sword or a battle axe, you, you can choose either of those. It's a martial melee weapon. Yeah, so the martial melee weapons, there's a lot of neat stuff in there. Like, there's a flail, there's a glaive, there's a great sword, and a halberd, and a lance. And if you're not sure what a lot of these things are, you can always Google them. Google will help give you a visual of what those are. <laughs> um, D&D typically does not make up weapons. So if they have it listed in the player's handbook, it's probably a real weapon from some culture or some time period. You can look it up, get an idea of what you're working with, and if that's not what you want, then choose something else. Uh, and I think I've decided that instead of a musical instrument, I'm going to start out with a trident. 
because I think that is an interesting weapon. Uh, but I also still get a martial weapon from my class, for which was that a pistol? I think I might do. Oh, that is a versatile weapon. Versatile weapons are cool. Um, there are different properties for weapons. Um, so versatile, you can use it two-handed or one-handed. If you do it two-handed, you get more damage. Do it one-handed, you can have shields. So, you have some options. I'm gonna pick a lance. Now remember, your character is most likely a humanoid. Um, most of the races are humanoid. So you're probably not gonna be able to wield a two-handled battle axe and a shield. You only have two hands. Right. <laughs> Talk to your game master. Maybe you can wear your shield on your back. Maybe you can't. It's going to be up to your game master's discretion. So and typically, sure. oh sorry. No, go ahead. Typically, if your shield is on your back, it might help protect your back, but it's not going to do anything if you're like face to face with a monster. Exactly. I think I've been thinking about this character. I think their like shtick for their performing gladiator stuff is gonna be sort of a, a C theme. So we've got the trident, we've got the I like the, the poke you from a distance or throw things at you kind of thing. So I'm trying to decide I might do javelin, but let me see. Yeah, I get four javelins anyway. Um, it's so. not so much a thing with fifth edition. Uh, but Pathfinder will let you choose other equipment as well. So, for example, if we were creating a Pathfinder character, Elon might be able to get a fishing net. So talk to your Game Master. Since we got extra money here for our backgrounds, your Game Master might let you start off with a an alternate item rather than some of that money. Darn, and that is Marshall not simple. I think it would be simple, but what do I know? And since it is a martial weapon and not a simple weapon, and we both agree that it should probably be a simple weapon, talk to your game master. Your game master might agree and let you use it as a simple weapon. Or if you have an idea for like, okay, so I want this weapon that does this thing. Like I have this idea. Or I had a character previously that she was a barbarian, but she had filed her teeth into points for her, for her character. Um, she was a, a gladiator as well. Um, and I talked to the DM and they're like, yeah, you can use your teeth as a weapon. That's cool. Yeah, so she's got pointy teeth and she gets she has a bite attack. <laughs> 1d6 bite damage. I think I only got a d4, but also she's a gnome. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> she also had a really cool whip that could reel her in because she was so small. So she could like reel herself up onto larger creatures. And her that's homebrew. Fossa. Yes, <laughs> that is homebrew. Talk, Talk to your, your DM. <laughs> I'm gonna do a spear. I got lots of pokey, stabby, throwy things. <laughs> okay. That's my weapon. And then I've got an explorer bag. Did you, you had an entertainer's pack, right? Yes. Yeah, so um, an explorer's pack will have something a little different. Um, it's a backpack, a bedroll, a mess kit, a tinderbox, 10 torches, 10 days of rations, a water skin, as well as 50 feet of hemp and rope that's strapped onto the side of the bag. Now, both of our packs came with rations and a water skin. This is going to be depending on how in-depth your Game Master would like to roleplay. A lot of Game Masters will want you to roleplay eating and drinking the way your character would, so you have rations and a water skin. 
However, some game masters will take some of that tedious stuff. Tedious stuff is just given, so they're not going to yeah, make well, you. Yeah, well, of course you ate today. Yeah, so they're not going to make you buy rations or fill your water skin. And again, that's going to be depending on how you want to play. All methods of gameplay are valid and relevant if you want to play a hyper realistic game where you have to role play all of that stuff by all means do that if you want to play a game where you don't have to role play some of that stuff by all means talk to your game master if you're not having fun then there's no point so make sure that you're having fun with it and if you're not find another game uh talk to your game master maybe they'll change things just make sure you're keeping an open line of communication with your game master and your fellow players as well exactly Communication is key. <laughs> Especially in a game that's based solely on your imagination. Right. You want everybody to be able to work together, and the goal of this game is not necessarily to win, it's to have fun. Like, that's the whole point. You're doing this to have fun. So. One of my favorite questions are, how do you win in D&D? And the answer to that is, are you having fun? You're winning. Yeah. As, even as a DM, like, how do I know if I'm doing a good job? Are your players having fun? Are you having fun? And you're doing a good job, you know? All right, I have my equipment on there. Um, we want to talk a little bit about physical characteristics. We haven't named our characters. Okay, let's do it. Um, so with your race, it's going to give you some description stuff for your character. Ooh, it's 5.30. <laughs> um, so it'll tell you kind of descriptions of what your character looks like, what they can do, um, or not what they can do, but what they look like, how much they weigh, how tall they are, um, and you can customize from there. They even have like a little box where you can draw your character if you want to, um, which I have done in the past. Um, and then names, you can find names in the handbook and I'll have some, as well as fantasynamegenerators.com is one I use a lot. Um, there are a lot of websites or just, you got a name you think is cool, do it. Not sponsored. Not sponsored. Um, yeah, and then there's also the last sheet um, with the character sheet set is spells, which I'm a barbarian, I don't have that problem. <laughs> uh, but for a bard, you've got spells. And caster classes are going to be a little bit more in-depth than melee classes. If you're just starting out, uh, by all means, if you want to play a caster class, go for it. But if you just want something quick and simple, um, you might want to go for melee. Um, caster class, you're going to have to think about spell slots. That roughly translates to how much energy you have to cast spells in a day. Your um, mana. Your mana. <laughs> if you will. Um, you're going to have cantrips, which are spells that do not take away from your spell slots. You can cast them at will. Um, so that would roughly translate or to anybody. a spell <laughs> that doesn't take you any of your mana. Um, so talk to your game master about spells. You might be able to homebrew something. You might be able to use a, a homebrew system for tracking your spells. Um, I am a bard, so at first level, I get... Two first level spells and I believe three cantrips. Let me just verify that really fast. Just to clarify, yes, this is a pill bottle. I keep my dice separated out by what kind of dice they are in pill bottles because it's an easy way for me to sort them because I have ridiculous quantities of dice. <laughs> so as a bard at first level, I get two cantrips and two first level spells. Um, and each each class has a different list of spells that they're able to use. So as a bard, I do not have access to standard wizard spells. I don't have Find Familiar, I don't have Fireball, I don't have anything like that. And likewise, a wizard wouldn't have standard bardic spells like Tasha Pitious Laughter or Charm Person. Well, they might actually have, but there is a lot of overlap, but um, for the most part, each class is going to have their own standard spells. And that's very customizable, and there is an enormous list of spells that are available for each class. So we probably won't go into that tonight. Um, again, get with your game master, check the player's handbook, 
We do not have time to go over all of them because there are a lot. so many, and it's all divided out by class and everything. Um, if you do have a player's handbook, it starts talking about spell casting on page 201, um, and then the next chapter as well lists all the spells, and that's on 207. Uh, but, you know, check it out. If you have questions, you can always send us a message. You can email us, um, or I guess email me, um, teens at popelibrary.org is my email. Um, and I will, you know, try to get back to you as quick as I can and help out if you have any questions. You can call the library as well. Um, and if I'm there, I will help you out. Um, I do only work part time, so if I'm not there, leave me a message and I'll, I'll get back. <laughs> All right, anything else we want to add as we kind of wrap up? We went a little later than I meant to. Oh, one thing I do want to mention, if you are watching this to get the points for Read Squared um, for a summer reading program, the code is CLOSA the Barbarian. I'm going to write that down so you know how to spell it. Um, can you use pen because the pencils might not work? And this is all caps. I think it's all one word, but if not, it's three words, um, and I can double check that. That's yours. All my pieces are here. Never mind. These are yours. I'm running out of room because I don't plan ahead well. <laughs> there. Punctuation. Cool. Spacing. Um, it's either with spaces or with no spaces. It is all caps. Um, and you can probably spell the barbarian, but Klossa is K-L-O-S-S-A. -S -S That's the known barbarian I've mentioned before. Um, it's super fun. And thanks to everybody who watched. Um, make sure to leave comments if you have any questions or if you want to show off characters you've made, um, anything like that. And let us know in your, if you are interested in um, us doing some sort of D&D group here. Um, we've had some stuff in the works. It's kind of derailed a little bit um, with COVID, but... Um, we are hoping to get something going maybe digitally um, in the near each future. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, and if you are playing in the near future, please make sure to, to drop us how your game went. Yeah, yeah, yeah let us know. Let us know. We, we want to know. We're interested. Yeah. All right. See you guys later. Oh, you want to end it? <laughs> the red and live video button. Bye. Bye. Bye.